Megan Oliver is a senior coastal scientist uh, at Greater Wellington Regional Council. She oversees the coastal monitoring and research program for the region and has had input into a range of the Sustainable Seas panels and research programs at various times uh, over the years. Uh, Megan, um, wonderful to have you here and to have had you here over the duration of the conference and uh, I'd like to welcome you up here to the podium. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, thank you, Pahia. Um, as you said, my name is Megan Oliver. I've been at Greater Wellington Regional Council as a senior coastal scientist largely for 12 years. Um, prior to that, I was at Niwa for 14 years. Um, so the question posed to us or given to us to sort of talk to today was how can the challenge achieve impact? And that's quite a big question. I think you can come at that from um, a range of angles. But uh, being the regional sector fangirl that I am, I'm kind of reframed it a little bit. And uh, I have reframed it as how can regulatory agencies like regional councils and DOC um, give effect or give life to um, EBM, basically, ecosystem-based management. I think we've heard enough today to know that we need to be doing it. We need to be doing it yesterday. What's the role for us in the regional sector and um, in central government to ground it in reality. And there's plenty of opportunity. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me actually is the work regional councils are doing already in the freshwater space. And so whether or not you think the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management is a good or even right tool for managing freshwater, it has forced regional councils into the rooms with mana whenua, community groups, fishers, or less so, uh, not marine fishers, freshwater fishers, farmers, foresters, um, water infrastructure providers. It's forced us around the table to talk about issues facing freshwater, to talk about the cumulative impacts of their activities and to talk about how we manage land use uh, and mitigate the effects of those different activities for improved outcomes in freshwater systems. Put that process on steroids and move it into the marine space and you've got something approaching EBM. I'm not saying we've got it 100%, I'm not saying we've nailed it, we certainly haven't fixed fresh water, but we're already being forced into those conversations um, through legislative requirement and that I think has been a great lever for us to actually resource um, our policy and science teams to work in that space. And so. Um, as noted this morning, if we could get EBM into, into law and into legislation and certainly embed those principles um, into the regulatory agencies, then we could start having these conversations for real. Um, and just the other few things um, that I wanted to say, the other opportunities I see uh, for regulatory agencies to be working and, and delivering, implementing EBM include collaborative monitoring and research. And Catherine, you referred to this the other day. We can't all afford to be monitoring everywhere all the time. We need to be joining up and sharing information. Call it SOE monitoring, call it ecosystem-based monitoring, call it what you like, common language and all that you've heard about. We're already doing a whole lot out there and we could um, bolster those networks to deliver on EBM. Uh, joined up reporting is also um, an opportunity and again include a range of knowledge systems, report on cultural values, report on uh, science measurements, report on community uh, and citizen science measurements. So joined up reporting as it reflects ecosystem based management and as it reflects even the impacts or activities of the blue economy. Uh, obviously policy enabling, preparing um, Policy that enables EBM is really crucial and a big role for the regional sector as these tools roll out, again, further to Amory, what you're talking about, the scenarios, what are the opportunities for us to develop enabling policy. And finally, um, I've hit upon a source of money. So to invest in not only restorative and regenerative activities, but that might inform um, the blue economy and development thereof. And that is wherever there are consent holders, big consent applicants that have to reclaim uh, portions of the coastal marine area, let's say 40 hectares for a shared roadway or pathway cycleway or to protect a shoreline and infrastructure, wherever they can't, 
um, mitigate or avoid the impacts they're going to have, they've got to offset and compensate. And there's money in them there at Hills. Um, because some of those projects, as we, as a coastal nation with our extensive coastline, look to armour our shores against sea level rise and coastal erosion, all of these big applicants, and I'm talking Waka Kotahi, Kiwi Rail and the like, have a lot of money to put towards offsetting and compensation. And as a marine um, sector, we're actually scrambling for projects for them to invest in. So I don't want to say buy banking, because that's another dirty word, depending on who you talk to, but there's a real opportunity to tap into that and direct it strategically into research and application of restoration and regenerative um, activities, and, and so inform the blue economy. And that's all from me. Kia ora. Thank you.